Hi friends, welcome to True Sovereign Self. I have a very special guest with me today. I have Richard Brannan from Spartan Life Coach. Some of you may recognize him. He has a very popular YouTube channel and he specializes in helping people recover from narcissistic abuse, um, complex PTSD. He's now coming towards my camera. <laughs> Uh, what else do you do, Richard? Uh, anxiety, depression, you're um, a certified NLP, master practitioner, you've got all the credentials, but most importantly, you have a lot of life experience, a lot of knowledge, and a lot of wisdom, which is what I want to tap into today, if we may. Very kind of you to say so, and I'm very glad to be on with you. Thank you for having me. No, you're welcome. So I want to start. So one of my favorite quotes ever is by Joseph Campbell, where he says, mystics swim in the same waters as the psychotic. So right now in the collective, we're seeing a mass psychosis where we're almost, almost all of us are having to become and tap into that inner mystic. So I want to start this conversation with talking about collective psychosis. And yeah, what's your take on that? I've actually never heard that that um, quote by uh, Joseph Campbell, but it's it's an interesting one, very useful one. I've actually always avoided talking about any mystical experiences I've ever had in my life because I know that it attracts psychotic types. I mean, I've had, I've had well, in the past when I've talked about that, I've ended up with you know stalkers and all kinds of you know icky uh, situations. So it's interesting to hear that said. Yeah, I do think um, that the time that we live in uh, pro part of the problems that we face are at the level of a kind of mass psychosis if we're talking about psychotic spectrum disorders as being that which is delusional and a full-scale break with reality and i would also agree that the solutions uh, will be drawn from um, mysticism i think that's why jordan peterson has enjoyed so much uh, success is because he's tapping into that mystic Jungian archetypal element that people are so craving for right now. Mm, mm, yeah, definitely. And just going on to um, some of the archetypes that we see, uh, social media, when I look at social media now, especially Instagram, and I see, I see the, dark, the dark feminine archetype is all over Instagram. It's, you know, it's almost a platform, and, and male as well, it's almost a platform for that. Do you think that some of these social media tools and even some of the uh, films that we have out there that are predictive programming us a little bit, do you think they're bringing out archetypes and things like that? Um, I'm going to do the gentlemanly thing and step in front of a bullet for you protectively here. Um, what you said was the dark female archetype. You did not accuse any women of behaving in any particular no, way. No, 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 no. And I... I... <laughs> No, I speak, I speak about my own dark femininity, you know, right. I, I, I'm quite open about, about my own. But what I'm referring to in, um, on Instagram is it's becoming like soft porn, is it not? Am I right? It is, it is. And then, and then you went on to mention and men as well. And it's not, so the female archetype and the male archetype, the yin and the yang energy, men and women hold both. Mm -hmm. And when, we, when you're talking about that dark female archetype, something that I would usually call, I mean, I've just done a course today about toxic yin. Um, those men on there are infected with it as well. And I've been speaking to men, particularly younger men, um, about how they're acting like, you know, uh, darkly archetypal women on social media they're actually they're also possessed with it they're also uh engaging in almost like a it's very reaction seeking behavior it's very superficial and it's very much in the with material world the world of the flesh so they're they're just basically sharing body parts with each other which is weird in and of itself but it gets a level weirder down the photocopying process of photocopy of photocopy of photocopy when it is photoshopped when it is filtered so you're actually sharing illusory images of your own body parts with strangers on the internet these are things that 10 years ago 15 years ago 100 percent couldn't happen it just it just wouldn't happen um for women to be able to do it men definitely wouldn't have been able to but then as time has gone by we've lost sight of healthy shame 
So there is a thing called toxic shame, which is bad. There's also a thing called mm. healthy shame, which is the thing that restricts you. So when you go, I could post this selfie of myself in a thong and get a lot of likes. You know what? I'm not going to. I'm going to go and watch the telly and go asleep instead. So there's that, that boundary, that healthy shame that would say, there's a part of me who wants to do that, but the adult part of me is saying, hey, maybe that's not a great thing to be doing with my life. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, how intimacy has changed? Because if you think, I think you're of pretty much a similar age to myself, but you know, when people used to, um, you know, back in the day, it was a flasher down the park, wasn't it, with a Mac, and they would flash the genitals. Now, people, people, people send me, even though I'm in a relationship, people send me stuff in my inbox, and it's just that that healthy shame isn't there, and there isn't them boundaries which you, I know you've spoken a lot about. There isn't them boundaries there anymore. They dissolve. Well, it's it's a um, it's a hard thing to talk about, especially if people can like visually see that you're older, because they'll be like, "Oh, this is somebody of an older generation just telling us not to have fun." And I'm like, "No, I'm all for you know going wild." I, I mean, I talk a lot about moral philosophy, but in your own personal life, you're not hurting anybody then go mm. for it. Have the mm. full Dionysian Bacchanalian festival. Doesn't bother me at all. But it hurts the people. It's, if you want to experience more pleasure and more intimacy and more happiness, that isn't the route to it. That's a simulation of pleasure and happiness. And that's the sick game that's being played. There's people who've been tricked into investing into a simulation of being happy instead of true happiness. So that's why that kind of level of boundary intimacy. Look, I mean, if I'm going to date a girl and before we've held hands, she's already sent me pictures of herself nude or semi-nude because that's what she's been indoctrinated and brainwashed into thinking I want, then to me, the way I describe it is it's, it messes up the timeline because people from our generation, the timeline was you saw someone, you liked them, you started talking to them, with words coming out of your face hole into their ear hole, usually, you know, like uh, in present reality, because there wasn't another option on the telephone. And then slowly you would maybe hold hands and then maybe you'd have a kiss and then maybe you'd talk some more and then you'd have more intimate contact. Like the contact would go in this singular direction. The way that it's being done now is like the timeline is constantly being broken mm. with the intimacy and it makes intimacy very very hard that's mm. one piece of the puzzle there's a lot going on there that makes people extremely intimacy averse now unfortunately now is is that because we're being programmed to do that or is that just our you know our shadow side what 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 do you what's your thoughts on that it's it's um it is the shadow side but what i'm i'm full tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist on this one i think that they have controversialized love controversialized intimacy and the purpose of that ultimately will be to criminalize love and criminalize intimacy and i stand by that statement as crazy as it sounds and i will never back away from it we are on a road now that ultimately criminalizes human love just as George Orwell predicted in his book, 1984, which he wrote in 1948, when O'Brien, the representative of Big Brother, says to Winston whilst torturing him, we, the party, will abolish the orgasm. We will destroy love. We will turn intimacy inside out and it will be banned. In that story, Winston is imprisoned and tortured for the crime, it's a sex crime. He has sex with a girl that he likes without a license. That's his crime. It sounds ludicrous, but look at the path we're already on. Mm -hmm. So, no, it's, it's deliberate, but there is a shadow self. What they've done is they knew from the insights that they garnered from Freud, from Jung, is they took those insights and they exploited weaknesses in human psychology for an end. And the end is to destroy intimacy, to destroy love, the ultimate purpose of which is to break the human spirit, is to induce so much shame, and so much humiliation, and so much isolation in people that they break psychologically and that they submit to whatever is is asked of them mm. and it's also it's also a break in the in the family unit and the dynamics between them a male and a female because you know like it, when we when we were talking earlier you said i'm going to be a gentleman and take a bullet for you here that was that was you being masculine towards towards our conversation 
but mm -hmm. some of these things that are happening now it's almost like you know your masculinity as men is being taken away my femininity as a woman is being taken away and i think that's part of it it's part of this you know this whole control you're absolutely right so the beginning of a long-term agenda to controversialize and ultimately criminalize love, sex, and intimacy begins by controversializing gender, begins by controversializing the sexes. Mm. And it's already, we're already way along that process and we're moving towards criminalization. So we're moving towards the criminalization of masculine behavior where it becomes, it's at least a thought crime, potentially a, a, a speech crime and potentially a hate crime to uphold a, a classically masculine way of operating in the world, to be at your masculine polarity. Similarly, it's not yet criminalized, but it's definitely controversialized if you want to be in your feminine polarity. That's becoming a sin. Mm -hmm. when, once it's a sin, eventually it will be controversialized more, then it will be criminalized. And the way they make it a sin is by suggesting to you, they will say this implicitly and explicitly, sister, you are failing your loyalty to the sisterhood because you are not upholding the archetype of strong independent woman as mm -hmm. written by Professor Beyonce, which means that you need to be absolutely everything to all people all the time and break under the enormity of that pressure or you have failed the orthodoxy. Mm, yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting you seeing these female archetypes that are coming, like you were saying about Beyonce, and she does these extravagant shows, doesn't she, where she's definitely, she's definitely harnessing something mystical in, in them shows that she's performing. She definitely is, and I think it's deliberate. I think it's completely hmm. deliberate. I think that she is supposed to, um, it's part of an overall psyop, it's a conspiracy. Um, she's particularly targeted to the black American community America. Um, the black American community, the women in that, so that she becomes an unattainable archetype where she tells or implies to these women, you can have it all, you should have it all, you should be everything to everybody all the time. Mm. And nothing in life works like that. Mm. It doesn't exist. It's a completely inhumane and non-human set of, uh, what would they say in psychoanalysis? These are injunctions they become they get internalized as introjects through the music hip-hop hip-hop was hijacked in the late 80s and mm. there are now introjects within the music that get into the superego that poison the superego that push negative values down onto the ego that force people to act in negative ways that just that just don't function when uh, let's you just continue with the example of beyonce when women fail to be this version of a strong, independent woman. Uh, what was her song? I quite like Beyonce. Uh, uh, she had lyrics in a song from about 10 years ago. A diva is a female version of a hustler. So it was like, we um, should be like men. We should be like men, but not you know, chivalrous nobility. We should be hustlers. We should be street level thugs, just like men are. Yeah. And that message goes straight into the unconscious because that's what happens when you use a lot of imagery when you use rhythm and when you use music and i've noticed some of the songs when i was listening to a song the other day i can't remember what it was but the overlapping of lyrics which i know is something that they use in subliminals and something that they've used in mk ultra trials with psychic driving so putting these subliminals into people and i think that on some level we've all been kind of mk ultra we have all been mk ultra these are Techniques that were uh, developed by the CIA. I think that they took um, a lot from uh, what the what the Nazis had learned. We know that they recruited uh, numerous people through Operation Paperclip, but then through studying the big enemy through the Cold War, which was Russia, they studied a lot of the uh, communist techniques as well. And I think what we've ended up with is them, the CIA, as as one body. Um, adopting and developing, and this is not conspiracy theory, this is a, a matter of historical fact. I mean, um, I have a copy of the papers that for the yeah. psychological development for Project Jedi, um, which were weirdly released. I just made a phone call and said, can I have a copy? This is back in 1996. I'm a psychology student. Can I have a copy of the Project Jedi psychology protocol? And I was sent that. They, just sent, they said, what's your address? And they sent it to me. Really strange. But I, I know for a fact 
that it's deliberate and that they were deliberately modeling uh, the patterns that were developed in communist propaganda. The, co the communist way of doing mind control was much more subtle, much more insidious, it was much more cunning. Uh, the, the Nazi way of doing things was basically by bullying people. If you bully somebody, you can actually increase their resistance, you can actually strengthen them. But if you can suggest that this is what you want, you want, you want this, it, it kind of hijacks the ego and the person starts believing that that's what they really want and that's why they do it. Yeah, it's what you taught in, you know, I, before I did all this, I had a sales career and it was, I used to work with surgeons and it's exactly what you're taught in sales. You know, you've got to make the yeah. surgeon think that this is his idea because he's got a God complex. So you've got to make him feel like that. Oh, her. Mm. Oh, interesting. Right. So how do people create boundaries in this time, space and reality that we're in? Because we are in, um, I think you said this on one of your videos and I've said it as well, that we are in kind of, it feels like we're in different dimensions, especially with the internet, because it does like how we're speaking now is, mm. you know, it's a different dimension, isn't it? It's a different time, yeah. space and reality. So how do yeah. people... How do people um, manage and maintain boundaries in this new era that we're in? I think the first step would be to be aware of the fact that the, um, the culture, you know, whatever that is, you know, write large, paint large. Um, when you're using social media, when you're listening to the news, when you're watching your favorite TV show, when you're listening to the radio, whatever it is, when you're talking to other people, is designed deliberately to erode all of your boundaries, the purpose of which is submission. What they want is submission, that's it. They're in charge, they want to stay in charge. It's not complicated. They want good tax-paying slaves. We live inside the matrix, they're harvesting our, our energy, and they don't want to be called out for it. It's as simple as that. So people first need to understand that they're bathing their minds in a culture that overtly we can track the history is about brainwashing. I mean, PR, sales, marketing, mm -hmm. branding, mm -hmm. that all comes from um, Freud's nephew, Edward Bernays. He, he created all that. It's a matter of mm -hmm. history. People could just go and look it up. Um, so first of all, they need to be aware of that. Once they're aware of it, then it would be nice if they started to pull back from it and either not engage as haphazardly in the culture as they would, don't let adverts run, when you're not concentrating. Don't let the news run when you're thinking about something else. Don't just listen to all the pop music that's out there without being selective and careful with it. And then to realize, look, this is happening and I value my consciousness. When people can say, I value my consciousness, whatever we value, we protect very naturally. You don't have to find a way of being boundary. If, if, you, if you value something, a child, uh, a partner, um, a person in your life, and that they're attacked, You'll protect them without conscious thought. You'll, unco you'll unconsciously respond with exactly the right boundaries to that scenario. So when we start valuing our own consciousness, our own attention, and treating it as precious, I think at that point we'll be more boundary than what we allow to come in. Mm, which I agree, but when our personal values are you know, kind of squashed every single day, I mean, especially, I mean, I know it's the same for men and women, but I can only speak from a woman's point of view, but... If I, was, if I was 10 years younger now, I think my psyche would be a complete and utter mess. Like, just because of the imagery that we are bombarded with on a daily basis. I, 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 it's, it's a big subject, and um, I have to be careful how I, how I phrase it because it, it triggers uh, people who identify as feminists. But I think women are far more propagandized to than men. With, there's a reason for that. There's an intent behind that. There's an intentionality behind that. And what you're talking about is not a matter of conjecture. The, the research is in. We can track what happens to the mind and the emotions of a, a 10 to 14 year old girl in the 15 seconds after she pushes like on an Instagram post. There was a study done on this. There's been plenty of studies done on it. It's definitely gonna damage your self image. It's definitely, mm -hmm. it's gonna give you body issues up the wazoo. Because you're bombarded, as you just said, with mm. images of beautiful women, photoshopped, filtered, and they don't have to say literally, look, young girl, this is how you need to look. All they need to do is show you, well, this girl has everything. This girl has the mm. good looking men after her. This girl is living the life. She's the one in Bali with the Gucci bag. Don't you want to be in Bali with the Gucci bag? And that young girl's going to internalize that. And those images have far more power 
on that young impressionable mind than any words could so absolutely i think women are more uh, propagandized to in this time they didn't need to attack men in order to attack men all they had to do is take women away from us that's how they broke the spirit i know how i wish, take... we, I wish they... we knew how powerful we were <laughs> <laughs> well you're seeing it now ladies when you see all these men depressed that's because uh, they they took they took you away from us and yeah we can't yeah. cope yeah we can't yeah. cope Oh, it's so interesting. When I go back to the UK, I remember recently on my recent trip, I rang my best friend up and she's a makeup artist and I was, and I've been away from the UK for a couple of years. And I was like, what has happened to people's faces? What has happened mm. to girls' faces? Like, you can't even, you can't even see. I mean, I've got makeup on now and I, you know, I love makeup. I'm a girly girl. I'm all for all that sort of stuff. But you can't even see a girl's face anymore. Like, and I was like, and I asked her, I said, what, what's happened to people's faces? And she went, now drag makeup is in fashion she was like drag makeup is everyday makeup and it just shows like the level of masking that we've actually put on ourselves which is and, really and, think, and think about it it's drag makeup it's mm. men that's men yeah so so women now are so animus possessed and so possessed mm. with this masculine spirit but it's not a good man that's possessing them no, it's a no, nasty it's guy that's possessing them i know <laughs> i know they're putting makeup on like an ugly dude who's parodying women. That's what drag queens do. They parody women. That you mm. could argue it's a celebration or you know, whatever. Fine. I, I'm not against it for it. Whatever. If it's funny, I like it. Maybe it's it's very funny. But nobody says that that's good makeup. Mm. Nobody's gonna tell me that's how women should be putting their fucking makeup on. And you're right. The other side of it, apart from the toxic masculine that it aspires to, is it's non-human it's slowly becoming more and more artificial. And these young girls, they don't care that they don't look like, because makeup is supposed to be an accentuation of what you already have. Of course, like, that's yeah. That's how I do my makeup. <laughs> and you've done it beautifully today, Richard. It's very beautiful. Your eyes look fantastic. You. Just a bit of blusher, that's all. <laughs> but this is, not, this is not an attempt to accentuate your own features. This is contouring, this is masking, this is, I want a mask. Let it be mm. 17 layers deep. Yeah, and they draw their eyebrows. Their, their eyebrows now, they paint over the normal eyebrows and draw them higher up. And it's all this insane, and you, like you say, it's toxic masculinity. Which is, it's, it's, it's really, it's savagely ugly. And it's very, very sad to see. I take a walk around Birkenhead City Centre or Liverpool City Centre, and it's heartbreaking. Mm. Puffy lips, everybody's looking like they've been boxing. They've got these ridiculous suck in the vacuum cleaner lips. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah, it is, it is. Oh, oh, so where so many places could go with this. How do we how do we come out of this? How do we? I mean, what do we do? Do we do we try and teach the young? How, how do we how do we kind of unravel ourselves from this? Because there is a clear agenda to make ourselves, you know, non-gender, non-human, just this cyborg that walks around, possibly with some Google lenses in their eyes in the future, which is already out there and already marketed. So how do we bring some, how do we bring humanness back? How do we bring it back? It's a, it's a, it's a funny thing you say that, this like move towards, you know, just with Google lenses, this creature. There's a science fiction writer, an American guy, uh, he's passed away sadly, called Harlan Ellison. He wrote a book, a science fiction. It's a short story. Anybody can find it online. It's called I have no mouth, but I must scream. And it actually talks in the short story format about the punishment of humanity by an artificial intelligence. And what we're seeing kind of feels like a non-human takeover by some malignant artificial intelligence that has a problem with humanity, but fundamentally fucking hate humans. <laughs> the way that I would suggest that people deal with this is to be okay. You can at the very least protect your own sanity. You can have a sense of humor. You can choose to connect with people who think like you. You can choose, you can make great conscious choices with the media you consume. There's a hell of an upside with the technology. There's plenty of upside with social media, but it has to be used in disciplined, intentional ways that mean that you're in charge. Because if you're not making the decisions about what your brain consumes, some other fucker's going to do it for you and they won't make nice choices for you. Mm -hmm. Oh God, I'm so glad I'm not a kid in this, this day and age. It must be so confusing. A hundred genders to choose from. I mean, if I was given that a kid, I would be now probably identifying as an elf or a fairy or something. 
<laughs> I, 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 I would have gone with squid or dolphin, I think. I would just, <laughs> just back out the game. It's very stressful for them. And we're seeing that reflected in the record number of uh, mental health issues amongst young people now. I think the statistic in the UK that the NHS released is something like amongst 10 to 12 year olds, the admittance to accident and emergency for anorexia and bulimia has quintupled, gone up by five times since 2012. Oh, wow. Amongst 10 to 12 year olds who are so sick with anorexia and bulimia, they have to go to accidents and emergency. So from this, we can extrapolate anorexia and, and bulimia is rampant. Body dysmorphia is rampant. Mm -hmm. I've been in gyms for the last 20 years and I'm looking at young lads now, 21 years old, and they're on every single kind of steroid under the sun, mm -hmm. trying to attain to this inhuman, unattainable look, which mm -hmm. is, you know, they'll look great now, but then by the time they're 30, they'll be, they'll, they'll be a mess. And um, so we're seeing, yes, you're right. Young people are very, very susceptible and very impressionable to these images. Mm, yeah, it's really, it's really sad. And it's, yeah, the whole, uh, the whole uh, male kind of buffing themselves up. It's almost like it's another protect. It's almost like males are feeling so out, disembodied and so, you know, out of their own power that they have to put all this muscle on to protect themselves because we haven't given the masculine the role that you you know naturally should be stepping into they're invisible that they, they feel completely invisible and um, that's very problematic you can't have huge swathes of young men who historically that's where violence comes from that's where that's who leads the vanguard in wars is young men that's why we call an infantry infantry it's for infants it's for the young you can't have them feeling invisible. You can't have these, these young guys uninitiated, invisible. And then a few of them make the choice. They go, well, at least I'll be seen. At least give me some followers on Instagram. At least if I've got a six pack and big delts, I'll get my 50,000 followers on Instagram. And then that means I'm cool. Yay. You know, mm. but at the same time, we know these, these men uh, and, and young women, they're, having, they're actually having way less sex than at any other time than, than we've recorded sexual conduct in, in human history. Why is that? They're just opting out. They just, you know, when we were growing up, that was, you wanted to drink, you wanted to <laughs> pass your driving license, get the club and get laid. That's what yeah. life was. Yeah. They don't want to drive, they don't want to go out and they don't want to get laid. Yeah, because you can just go on your Tinder profile and you can just send somebody a nude and then you can, you know, all you can your... send each other nudes, which they enjoy because they're retrained to get the serotonin and dopamine mm. dump from validation. And you go, oh, you look hot, you look hot. Oh, that's cool. But they can't actually follow through and have sexual contact with another human being because they're riddled with body dysmorphia and really riddled with uh, body image issues. Plus, they're terrified because they've been consuming so much porn produced by psychopaths that features ultra athletes doing the most incredible sexual gymnastics and they think that's what sex is they're going well i i can't do that i can't keep up like that i can't make so sex has become this weird terrifying domain that uh many are just opting out of this going no it's far too intimidating oh and it's changed the way we have sex i read a study about uh, young men now expecting um when they have vaginal sex also expecting anal sex as well because of palm programming because they've you know, they've been watching this and that's what their brain is telling them that that's how they have sex. Well, that's, that's, that's normal. That becomes, that becomes the new normal. Um, and that's the frightening thing um, is what is now normal. You know, the new normal has changed exponentially in the last 20 years. So for Generation X, we're sort of our heads are spinning because mm. we, we've lived I mean, you would have lived multiple times the experience of having a plastic camera with only 24 pictures on it. Yeah. And being careful, you know, don't drop it. Don't, you know. Be, yeah. Can Think you imagine a, a computer now mm. in your pocket? Fucking five hours of HD video you can record. You can call your mom. You can, it's, it's, the, it's almost like our, we, our staffed monkey brains are kind of overwhelmed by all of this, pro this uh, progress and, and it's, it's, it's created this traumatic response. Mm, yeah, I think I remember my first trip to Ibiza, I think I probably had a throwaway camera and I'm glad I did because I wouldn't want their pictures on the internet. 
which is the other thing that is apparently is affecting the sexual contact. They're, they're terrified of, of being um, videoed because everybody is carrying a CCTV camera in their pocket and everybody can upload it straight to the internet. You know, within seconds, they could live stream it. Mm. So people aren't doing the things with a sense of freedom that they would have been, uh, you know, when, when we were uh, growing up. Yeah, yeah. People don't dance anymore. You know, you used to go out to dance and to, you know, to have oh, a laugh and people don't Ibiza dance Ibiza now is just, a, it's just a group of people standing in a club, sipping drinks and flexing. And I'm like, I thought Ibiza would be, you know, do you remember the days, the glow sticks, oh, the yeah. hats? <laughs> yeah, I remember Ibiza when it was good. We, uh, uh, so I'm in Playa de Carmen in Mexico and there is a, there is a tour here just to get uh, pictures for Instagram. So you can pay for the tour and they will take you to all the Instagram sites around, around the place. And I'm like, wow. They won't be struggling for money. That'll be a business that works very well. Yeah. And I went to one of the cenotes recently, which for anyone that doesn't know, is just a cave with some water in it. And they're really beautiful over here. And I was doing some snorkeling and I was enjoying the, you know, the cabins underground. Popped my head up from the water. There was five women around me that just was just like doing the most ridiculous poses. Their hair wasn't wet. They wasn't here. They wasn't enjoying it. And it was just like, yeah. have I entered a hell realm? That's what I thought. I popped up and I was like, have I entered a hell realm? Think, think of this. All of that generation, they'll never admit it, but I know the truth, would far rather, far rather have the simulation of an experience that they can make other people jealous with than mm. actually have the experience. So mm. if you said to them, would you rather that we took, uh, we simulated a video of you going around the most beautiful locations in Mexico and everybody will see it on social media, or you actually get to live that, but nobody gets to see it. I guarantee you like 98% of that generation will choose the fake version. They'll choose the version where they never actually physically go to Mexico, but they show everybody that they did. Mm. So is it a simulation in a simulation then, Richard? It's becoming an inception type scenario, absolutely, where you do have a simulation within a simulation within a simulation because they have, they, uh, the powers that be have successfully fractured the human ego. Mm. What I mean by that is people now have, as the, the digital natives coming up, they have their real self, their daily self, their daily ego, and now they have also like a hard drive ego, which is their version of themselves online. And these are two fully formed, separately functioning selves, which does what? It renders everybody essentially in a schizophrenic relationship, the schism between the ego and the second ego, which is, a, which is what pushes people into psychotic spectrum disorders. Mm. Oh, it's interesting times. We're in interesting times. Right. Okay. So um, I have a question from a friend, a very good friend who wants to know, how transferable trauma is. So we know it's transferable through families and we know it's, it's transferable in DNA, but how transferable is it in the collective? Uh, very, I think is, is the answer. On the individual level, uh, the studies have been done for people with um, PTSD. Uh, particularly, there were a lot of studies done with combat veterans that show that when people come home uh, with combat-based PTSD, the entire family can get mm -hmm. sick. Um, the usage of porn goes up, gambling goes up, alcohol goes up, just coping mechanisms, negative coping mechanisms, mechanisms go up. Interestingly, seeing as we were talking about men and women before, when a, a, a female combat vet comes home, the husband gets sicker than when a male combat vet comes home with the wife. Oh, I don't know wow. why that is, but men seem to respond much worse to seeing their partner in distress. Perhaps it's the desire to protect or yeah I don't, I don't know yeah. why but men get a lot sicker with it that's that secondary trauma and um, so that that definitely happens that's the literature i think that collectively yeah we are seeing trans the transference of trauma it's not that hard to transfer trauma plus we live in a highly traumatic culture anyway mm. the films the music hey i just found something out the other day you'll like this because you like music uh, it's called um pierre taught me this it's called the loudness wars when you look at a pop music track now versus from, say, the 80s or 90s, in the 80s or 90s, it would go up and down. The wave files would go up and down. Now, everything is on blast. It's completely thick. So every single musical instrument is at its top volume because they found that it made people consume more of that music.
because it's more attention grabbing, it's more adrenalizing. So just think of that. You jump in a taxi to go anywhere, you're being blasted with traumatic music. Mm. The, the hysteria dial has been dialed up on everything. Everything is a scream and a screech. Mm. Nobody's wants to, well, very few people want to talk and debate and reason and think and pause and listen to the other. Everybody's mm. interrupting, screeching, trying to get their point across. The, 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 the volume dial has been turned way up, literally in the realm of pop music. I thought that was pretty interesting. Wow, no, it is interesting. I remember just going back to going to Ibiza. The last time I went to Ibiza, I mean, I went when I was, you know, 36 now, so it was early 2000s. And the last time that I went, the music had completely changed. I don't know if it's because the drugs had changed there, but the music wasn't, wasn't happy anymore, wasn't uplifting anymore. It wasn't, you know, there wasn't any nice vocals in it. It was just like, and it was the most boring experience I've ever had of Ibiza. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, uh, I went to the closing of Space, uh, which is yeah, 2016, three yeah. years ago. Mm. Depressing. As yeah. fuck. It was really Space, depressing. which I was in. <laughs> was it? Yeah, it was in Space. Oh. I was in and I was like, I am never coming to a beat again. It is not the same island. And I loved that place when I was younger. I loved it. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I, obviously I was just living there five months. I didn't go inside a club. I didn't hit one bar, one club mm. at all. I was just there to be, to be out in the nature. From that side of it, it's beautiful. But when I first got there, I spoke to a, an older DJ who'd been living there for 30 years. And I was saying to him, this is the kind of music I want to listen to, where it's upbeat, makes you want to get up, it's high energy, it's positive, makes you want to dance. And he was like, you, you won't find that here. Nobody wants to listen to that shit. Mm. Nobody wants to listen to it. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, interesting. And just going back to what you're saying about nobody wants to debate anymore. I don't think we're allowed to debate anymore. You know, we're, we're policing each other so much. Like, I am so cautious about what I, what I'm saying, what I say now to people because it, everybody is offended. Like, literally, everybody gets offended by anything. That's that's the that's the effect of the purely communist tactic that's been adopted to basically break our will and under the fascist systems they would just make the punishment for speaking out worse and worse and worse more and more horrific which actually is nowhere near as smart as convincing the population to police each other and to police themselves so we absolutely live in a time where people are spying on each other and they don't even have to report it to anybody i mean this is why people are so fucking awful now they're telltales they're crybabies they sneak around behind each other's backs and they're constantly calling for authority to come and fix it. If I say something on YouTube that somebody doesn't like, their first move isn't to challenge me and say, listen, this is why I don't think you should say that. Firstly, they attack my, my character. They go straight to ad hominem. And if that doesn't work, they'll report me. They'll try and go to a higher authority to shut me down. Can you think of the pettiness and the mean-spiritedness of that? Because you said something I don't agree with and I can't force you to agree with me, Cancel it, take her off, deplatform it. And mm. they think that's okay. They think that's, that's the way that adults should interact. It's completely insane. Yeah, it is completely insane. What's your craziest viewer moment? Have you had any strange stalkers or any crazy? <laughs> uh, I'm just being nosy now. <laughs> I've had, uh, I've, I think I've had people who, several times, who I thought, I knew what was going on with them. I was like, oh, this is complex post-traumatic stress. Mm. This person is certainly vectoring for borderline personality disorder. But what I don't know that much about and what I found truly intimidating and disturbing when I come face to face with it is that psychotic spectrum disorder. So I've had experiences where I've spoken to people face to face that come up to me in seminars mm. and they'll tell me about a whole dialogue that they've had with me. And they're not being... They're not like trying to be a wind up to get my attention. I'm looking in their eyes and they genuinely believe that I'm in their lives. That one woman came up to me after a seminar in um, America and she had a big bag with her and everybody had left and she was reaching inside of her bag and she said, I've got something to show you. And I was like, if this is how I go out, my mom is going to be well disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> she, pu she pulled out um, these writings and uh, I found out that what happened is she'd been prescribed Adderall and she'd been on it for 10 years. Mm. She decided to stop. And when we don't, we don't use Adderall at the, at the mm. same level. So I wasn't, I had to find out about this afterwards. 
apparently if you just stop taking Adderall like that, you actually go in psychosis. So she believed, and she'd written like a book worth of stuff, that in her dreams, I'd been teaching her how to stop time. And she was like, do you want to see the diagrams of how to stop time? And I was like, I don't. And also we need to walk towards some witnesses. So if you do start stabbing me, <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, I, and that's way beyond me. That's like, it's, um, I, I restrict myself to the title of, of life coach and I'll help people. I'll talk to them about CPTSD, but once you get into psychotic spectrum disorders, which is, which is what we open with talking about, I just say, okay, I, I, I don't know how to do it. I don't know what this is and I don't know how to deal with it. Maybe on another realm, Richard, you're, uh, you're way up there teaching. I'm teaching realm. people how to, I, I actually taught her in a bathtub. She told me how we were in oh. bathtub and that's how, which is where I teach people how to stop time. So yeah. Oh, okay. All right. I'm sure there's many, I'm sure there's many women that will sign up for that course, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> we're in a bathtub teaching time travel. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, that was really good. I really enjoyed that. So just before we finish, just, just to wrap up, is there anything that you can just advise the people watching this, how to kind of swim in these psychotic waters that we're in at the moment and how, I'm, I'm very, I'm very hopeful. I think that um, humanity has been through cycles like this, like this before, not quite this before, but like this before. Um, I think we're going to do just fine. I think ultimately um, we'll overcome this as we've overcome mm -hmm. everything else. There might be a bit of a fight. There is a bit of a fight on now. Some people are saying we're already in the middle of an ideological war. I remain optimistic and upbeat and cheerful. And uh, you can trust me because I uh, have a YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i think the human i think you're right the human spirit is very um very strong and it's we'll, very we'll overcome it and uh, you know us, us having a conversation like this online mm -hmm. uh, means that we're interested in it and if we're interested in it then other human beings just like us will be interested in it as well and perhaps we're seeing the beginning of a tip back the other way which would be which would be lovely to see yeah yeah no this i think this is a really good test for us right now mm -hmm. Uh, test for us to change the narrative because there's certain stories that are out there in the press that with awareness we you know we can we can change so it's a good absolutely. time to be it's an interesting time and a good time to be alive absolutely absolutely so, thank you for your time today and uh yeah guys check out richard's um channel he's got two channels and i'll leave them in the links in the description below they're both really interesting and yeah i really appreciate your time and I really appreciate your words and thank you very much Thank you for having me. It was an okay. absolute pleasure. Anytime. All right. Thank you.